the entire globe, even as it trembles in passion with the birth of new nations and shrinks in the hand of a dispassionate science, is today the site of a momentous conflict. As each side attempts to prove to the world the superiority of its position, the conflict is fought with the words of diplomats, with gestures of friendship and help to uncommitted countries, even with cultural demonstrations. It is fought indeed on every level of man's experience, for the stakes are high. As one of the adversaries in the conflict, we see a challenge as great as any in our historic past, a challenge not we hope to be met and joined in battle, but to be faced and fought in the hearts and hopes of men. It is the challenge of ideas. I'm Edward R. Murrow. For a little while, I would like to review with you the great conflict of our times, one which demands and must get the attention and the involvement of each one of us. This conflict is the reason why most of you are in uniform, and some of you will be going overseas, servicemen, families of servicemen, and civilians working for the Department of Defense. Because of this conflict, many of you are already abroad, more than a million Americans in 91 foreign countries. First and foremost, of course, Americans are overseas to help preserve the peace. By maintaining an alert readiness to meet the threat of aggression, America's armed forces in concert with those of its allies are serving as a deterrent to war. Some of you may wonder how directly involved in the contest you are or will be. Perhaps your active duty is behind you, or soon will be, and with it, you may believe your involvement in the contest ends. But the truth is that involvement in this conflict is far-ranging indeed. It touches not only members of the armed forces and their families, but everyone who supports the mission of the armed forces, every defense worker, every taxpayer who foots the bill, who in fact is not involved. And the conflict itself, how can it be defined? Well, let's look at it this way. The communist bloc would like to see the entire world under communist domination. Over the years, as the strength and determination of the free world has gradually convinced communist leaders that aggressive war would be a reckless and costly gamble, they have begun to talk more and more about their ability to win from us in the arena of ideas. This, of course, is fine with us, for we are a people with a traditionally great faith in our ideas, the ideas that have moved mountains and created wealth and shaped us as free men. And we are confident that history can do no other than award us the victory in any contest in which ideas are the weapon. But I would like to say this, confidence by itself without effort does not win contests. Victory in this conflict depends on much, much more than confidence. It is a contest unlike any we have ever faced in our history as a nation. It is total competition with an antagonist who is putting into it everything within his capability. It is not a conflict between peoples, but between basic values and systems of government, between the principles of life each believes in. When we talk of these conflicting values, we are obliged to speak of that special quality which we call, for want of a better phrase, individual liberty. And when we talk of this liberty in America, we talk with many voices, for we are a diverse nation, and there are perhaps as many concepts of what America is as there are people among us. But although we look at America through different eyes, there are many insights into the essence of our moving and growing nation that we share. I'm John Wayne. Is there any better or equal hope in the world, Lincoln asked, than the ultimate justice of the people? We Americans believe there is not. The stonework of our national life is made of this belief. We believe in many things, but this belief that man is a responsible being bears out our own unique stamp as a nation. As a people, we are active and often noisy. 
We are industrious. Oftentimes to the bafflement of ourselves and our friends. We relax as hard as we work. We are proud. We are sentimental. Beauty is of national concern to us. For some of us, its pursuit is a deadly serious pastime. The rest of us simply enjoy the results. Some of our national spirit shows up in the monuments we erect, the large ones and the small ones. It rings through the music which animates us. occasion some difference of feeling. At other times we are united. We are all these things and many more, but above everything else we are free. We believe in the ultimate justice which we as free men can create. Our heritage of freedom is our most priceless possession. Men before us have died to keep it alive and men in our times have done the same. But although men have died to preserve it, and may die again. The glory of this heritage is the vision of life that it has given us. A life of dignity and nobility of spirit, such as men have never before been enriched by in the long march through the history they have recorded. There is a phrase which recurs in our national documents, the literature of our story as a people, which points to the source of our belief in individual freedom and defines perhaps better than any other the nub of the conflict between the opposing systems of values which sweep the world today. That phrase is, this nation under God. That phrase and others like it set the standard of our concept of man. As a creature of God, man is a being with dignity and conscience, with the ability to determine right from wrong and the obligation to act on that right. From this belief in man as a responsible being flow the beliefs in his other qualifications which we accept, usually even without bothering to think about them, as parts of that vague condition which we call the American way. His ability, indeed his right to explore the truth in all things, his ability to govern himself, and his ability to handle his own economic problems. The opposing point of view in this conflict rests on a fundamentally different vision of man. As a creature, not of God, but of the state, in this system, the value of individual man diminishes sharply, and the state is all important. The state will run his life for him, his political life, his business life, his social life. What we oppose fundamentally is the aggressive nature of the communist state, its unceasing effort to expand wherever it can.
to grow bigger, to take over, to supplant. This deadly impulse toward aggression we oppose as a continual threat to peace. These are the contrasting points of view between the major antagonists in the conflict which has become known over the last decade as the Cold War. For an appraisal of this continuing and protracted conflict, we can go to a reporter who has watched the growing conflict with the perception of a trained military observer. I am Hanson Baldwin. I have here the policy statements of each of our services on the contest we're engaged in with the communists. What they boil down to is this. It is a contest for the minds and hearts of people around the world, all people. The areas in white on this map represent the part of the world composed of ourselves and those who share our beliefs. The communists seek constantly to win an advantage in the minds of the people here and to separate us. The black portion of the map is the communist dominated part of the world controlled by the Soviet Union and the Chinese communist regime. And of tremendous importance is that part of the world which is attached to neither camp. The uncommitted nations of the world, represented in gray on the map. For the most part, these nations are absorbed with their own problems. Either they are newly independent after years of domination by a foreign power, or they are still seeking independence. A strong tide of nationalism sweeps over this part of the world, and with it, a mistrust of anything they feel is associated with the old ways of colonialism. They are not committed to either side in the conflict. Our own policy toward them has been one strictly of watchful, non-intrusive friendship, giving help when help is asked for, but otherwise keeping hands off their internal affairs. The communists have been more direct their local party members have not hesitated to exploit to their own advantage the passions that smolder in these new states and to identify themselves in the minds of the people there whenever possible with anti-colonialism and us with its opposite. It is part of their worldwide technique. How do our military services adapt themselves to this conflict in which perhaps no gun may be fired? by recognizing that the activities and performances of all their members in every foreign country in which they are stationed will either add to or detract from the goodwill our nation needs in this contest for the respect of the peoples of the world. The President of the United States has called developments of good relationships between United States citizens abroad and members of their host countries basic to the full attainment of our foreign policy objectives and the services have responded by promoting such good relationships as part of their overall policy. The communists initiated the Cold War for the same reason they would have started a hot war had that been feasible, or would now, should they ever decide that the free world was weak enough for them to risk it. Whatever the degree of tension they create, it is a substitute for hot war, another means of achieving their end. And their end, of course, is world conquest, short of war if possible. World conquest by actions short of war. Actions that are political, economic, and ideological. How do the communists apply these three methods? First, we will consider the political method and the techniques the communists use when they attempt to acquire their objectives in this way. We would do well to consider the success the communists have had by using the political method alone. As you will see from the black area on this map, they have expanded between 1940 and 1954, took over 15 countries, totaling 714 million people. Since 1954, there have been major internal disruptions in nine additional countries outside the Iron Curtain. Now, how do they go about applying this political method? The communist coup in Czechoslovakia in 1948 provides us with a blueprint of the ideal formula for political conquest, which includes taking over a country 
without outside intervention. Destruction of its parliamentary form of government. Murder of its democratic leaders when necessary. Rigged elections with only the communist candidates on the ballot. Once the penetration is complete, all this is backed by the naked force of military occupation. By such devices, the Soviet Union turned its neighboring states into satellites, political and economic puppets. In China, political action was cruder, but no less effective. Here, it was political action by conquest. And so overwhelming has this political conquest been that the communists have been able to propel Red China to a position of major influence in the Eastern world. The political force method includes the suppression of freedom in a country already under communist control without outside interference. Inside the Iron Curtain, there were revolutions without help from the outside. In East Germany in 1953, Poland in 1956, Hungary in the same year, and Tibet in 1959, all of them brutally suppressed. And finally, there is the International Communist Party, dedicated to the subversion and overthrow of every still free government. Where the political method may not prevail, there is always the economic method. I'm Frank McGee. Let's consider for a moment this matter of the communist use of economic methods to achieve conquest and how it's done. The present masters of the Soviet Union have said to us, peaceful coexistence until we bury you. They propose to officiate at our interment by catching up with us industrially and then surpassing us. They're working hard at it. Today, the 200 million inhabitants of the Soviet state bend their backs and their talents to the Kremlin's will. And Sputnik and Sputnik's successors have proved conclusively enough the USSR's proficiency in the area of technical ability. Throughout the vast stretches of this empire, you find new industrial cities, Plants, assembly lines, the most modern equipment. Soviet products of every description awaiting delivery and reaching industrially backward areas of the non-communist world. Teams of Russian technicians are available to operate this machine. This is economic penetration, paving the way for political takeover. The hand of Soviet friendship, which usually precedes an attempt at economic penetration, has been reaching into every part of the world which shows the slightest inclination to receive it. Recently, we've seen it extend into our own hemisphere, into turbulent Cuba, where it was embraced as a triumph of Soviet policy. A few statistics will demonstrate how serious this threat is becoming to the free world. Of the entire annual Soviet economic capability, their gross national product, 70%, or it may run as high as 80%, is devoted to the area of heavy industry. The U.S. and free world share of gross national product devoted to the same area is certainly not much more than 20%. In terms of volume applied to this area of gross national product, the Soviet Union is beginning to surge ahead. Finally, the communists attempt ideological penetration. Perhaps their strongest efforts go into this kind of penetration into the free world. Before we talk about ideological penetration itself, let's take a look at the reasons why this form of penetration is so important to the communists. For one thing, communist aggression has alarmed many free nations and produced their united will to resist. These nations have implemented their will to resist all other forms of Soviet penetration through a number of trade agreements. The United States and other industrially strong nations of the free world are actively promoting better living conditions all over the world. This has the effect 
not only of helping these countries to improve their industrial and economic position, but also of providing a defense against communist intrigue, which flourishes in depressed economic areas. The military potential of the free world has been revived by such mutual defense pacts as the North Atlantic Treaty Organization in Europe, the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization to counter aggression in this part of the world, the ANZUS Treaty, and the Rio Treaty to provide hemisphere defense. All over the world, our allies are now setting up their own defense bases with the technical know-how to operate them. This kind of military help by us is not by any means a one-sided operation. The nations involved contribute as heavily as they can. No less valuable are the morale and friendly relations being generated between servicemen of all the participating countries in joint training programs, demonstrating their respective skills to each other. They cross the language barrier to comradeship. This banding together by nations with a common purpose has produced strength not only in the military and economic fields, but in the realm of moral and spiritual values as well. At a meeting of the NATO Atlantic Congress in 1959, a statement was adopted which called attention to the moral unity binding the member nations. This document recognizes respect for human dignity as the inalienable basis of civilization. Among the fundamental rights of man specifically named are respect for the sanctity of human life. The right to freedom of speech, of conscience and religion. of opinion and belief. The right of every man to work and to receive his just reward. The right of the family to stability. And the right of parents over their children and their education. In all these ways, economically, militarily, morally, the world outside the communist orbit slowly draws itself together the practical communists appraise this consolidation of free world defenses. It confronts them with a serious deterrence to their world ambitions. Hence, they must destroy allied unity, or at least weaken it. How? Well, here we return to the subject of ideological penetration. For if all other forms of penetration don't work, if the united strength of the non-communist world makes political penetration unfeasible and economic penetration unsuccessful, if cultural penetration does not do the job, the communists can always hope to succeed by resorting to ideological warfare against their strongest opponent, meaning us. Americans go home. Wall Street warmongers, down with American imperialism. Peace, yes, peace, their propaganda screams on communist terms, naturally. Inside the free world, communists and their sympathizers seek to foment suspicion and distrust of our motives, even attempt to influence our allies to eliminate our overseas bases, which are protecting them as well as us. Their mediums of mass communication are tireless in vilifying us as a nation and as individuals such as depicting you as a brute and a ravager. Is there a chance that the communist will succeed? Is there a possibility that our allies will accept this malicious perversion of us and everything we stand for? In large part, that is going to depend on how thoroughly we understand this conflict and how dedicated we are to victory. Understanding is a continuing process and it embraces many different aspects of our day-to-day -day living. It is, at root, a function which involves the flow of information. I am Lowell Thomas. We live amid the greatest abundance of information any people has ever had. But survey after survey reveals an astonishingly low informational level among us. To be sure, the right to remain uninformed is one of the privileges of a democracy, but in a contest such as the one we are engaged in, it is one of the surest ways of losing our freedom. Being informed does not mean only keeping up to date on current events, important though that is. It means also being aware of developments within our own nation and the forces that move through it. 
its weaknesses as well as its strengths, we all too often dishonor our freedom and demean it. But that's not the full story. If it were, our system would have collapsed long before this. The full story is in the progress we consistently make through law and through education, the way free men must. The communists would like to have you, as well as people in every country in the world, believe otherwise. And once they have succeeded in letting the idea take root that our deficiencies are our chief characteristics, once they have managed to erode our faith in ourselves at least a little, that much of the battle is lost. A snake of a whisper is abroad that Americans have lost touch with their past. Is it true? It can't be, if we are to survive and win. If we understand the conflict, then we understand the need to keep America strong in our greatest challenge by keeping alive the standards and the traditions which have been her glory. What are the bulwarks of our past? upon which our society has been built. There are many, and we have discussed some of them. Our spiritual heritage, our belief in individual liberty. But there is yet another, as important as any of these. I am Helen Hayes. Many of us who are living now will never see the end of the conflict which dominates our lives. Leaders change and leadership passes from one generation to the next. But for generations, or certainly for many years, the challenge which confronts us will continue. So it becomes not just a hope, but an urgent condition for a peaceful future that those who are catapulted into the problems of maturity with every passing year will understand the challenge and devote themselves to it even as you and I must. Interest cannot lag, efforts cannot cease. It will require the sternest kind of dedication, bred as it were into the American character. The training grounds in which this discipline will be planted and perfected are the institutions which have shaped our society, particularly the home, which has always been in our culture the nucleus of society itself. The home is the wellspring of the strongest qualities of citizenship, and it must remain so if we are to preserve the toughness of moral fiber, which is our strongest heritage. A toughness of moral fiber, a belief in the right, as God gives us to see the right, as Lincoln put it in words which are carved into our national soul. These are the sinewy threads of our past. Keeping America strong, this is our challenge. Keeping the vision of liberty bright. Keeping the threads of our past, the strands of moral toughness with which our history is bound. Moral toughness, the quality which made men work instead of weep on the hostile shores of New England. Which bled mortally, yet never died, on a hundred fields and oceans stretching out from Valley Forge which moved strong men west, bringing with them first only their pride, then their railroads, which built cities and governments, and created wealth, and above all, made freedom the birthright of every man. That quality must still live within us, or without it, we are surely lost, and it will live, so long as we keep faith in our future and faith in our past. This is the challenge, as compelling, as severe, as crucial, as Americans in any age have ever faced.